Singapore's healthcare system is considered one of the best around the world. It ranks number one among 188 countries in the United Nations Health Global Rankings in 2016. A large part of the reason perhaps owe to Singapore's approach in delivering healthcare to the people, focusing on quality, efficiency and cost. Another reason, as some healthcare researchers noted, Singapore has no remote or rural areas. Everybody lives close to doctors and hospitals. Singapore also has less poverty compared to other developed nations, a more progressive tax system, and housing that is heavily subsidized by the government. In today's video, I am going to dive a little bit deeper into the Singapore healthcare system today. The government designed the system and healthcare services to ensure Singaporeans have access to good and affordable healthcare for all their healthcare needs, from primary healthcare at the local GP to acute specialist hospital care. At the base of the pyramid, primary healthcare services are provided by professionals, usually family physicians in polyclinics and private medical clinics within the community. These healthcare professionals are often the first point of contact with patients. They provide holistic and personalized care for patients of different age groups. They treat acute conditions such as acute respiratory tract infections, manage chronic illnesses like diabetes, and keep the population healthy through preventive measures such as targeted health screening. They also help to coordinate patients' care with other providers and help patients who require more specialized medical attention to navigate the healthcare system. In Singapore, primary healthcare is provided through an island-wide network of outpatient polyclinics and clinics run by private general practitioners. There are currently 20 polyclinics and about 1,700 GP clinics around the island. It is worth noting that 80% of Singaporeans get primary care from private sector general practitioners. The remaining 20% seek primary care through polyclinics that are designed to treat as many patients as possible and as quickly as possible. A visit to the polyclinic usually costs less than $20 for subsidized patients. As one-stop healthcare centers, the 20 polyclinics are located throughout the country and they provide subsidized primary care, which includes primary medical treatment, prevention health care, and health education. At the top of the pyramid, on the other hand, is the provision of acute care. It is done through general, general hospitals that provide multidisciplinary acute inpatient and specialist outpatient services, and a 24-hour emergency department. In addition, there are national specialty centers for cancer, cardiac, eye, skin, neuroscience, dental care, and medical centers for multiple disciplines. The ratio of public and private care is flipped when it comes to hospitalization. About 20% of inpatients choose a private hospital care while 80% choose public hospitals. And within the public hospitals, patients have a choice of the different types of ward accommodation on their admission. Class B2 and C class uh, admissions, which account for about 80% of public hospital beds, are heavily subsidized, while class B1 admissions are subsidized at 20% and there is no subsidy for class A ward accommodations. To drive efficiency and innovation, the government restructured all its acute hospitals and specialty centers some 30 years ago to be run as private companies wholly owned by the government. This is to enable public hospitals to have the management autonomy and flexibility to respond more promptly to the needs of the patients. In the process, commercial accounting systems have also been introduced, which provides more accurate picture of the operating costs and instilling greater financial discipline and accountability of the, of the hospitals. The public hospitals are different from the other private hospitals in that they receive an annual government subvention or subsidy for the provision of subsidized medical services to patients. 
they are to be managed like not-for-profit organisations. If you would like to find out more about how healthcare landscape in Singapore transformed over the years, you may check out another video that I did earlier and I'll place a link at the end of this video. The government has also introduced community hospitals for intermediate healthcare for the recovering sick and aged who do not require the care of a general hospital. They belong to a series of intermediate and long-term care services that are typically required for persons who need further care after being discharged from acute hospital as well as community dwelling seniors who may be frail and need someone to watch over them or to help them with their need, daily needs. Some examples of the ILTC services include home-based services such as home medical, home nursing, home palliative, meals on wheels, home personal care, medical escorts and transport services. Besides, there are also centre-based services for example, community rehab, day rehab, dementia care, day hospice care. And finally, there, there are also residential IOTC services which include community hospitals, chronic sick unit, nursing homes, rehab homes, and for persons with mental uh, health needs to recover, sheltered home, inpatient hospices, and respite care. The Singapore government uses this to control and regulate new healthcare technologies drugs, devices with careful scrutiny. The government also uses its power to mandate public health initiatives. For instance, the government declared war on diabetes in 2016 and got the beverage manufacturers to agree to reduce sugar content in drinks to a maximum of 12% by 2020. This resulted in these changes that we observed recently. For all its successes, Singapore's healthcare system is not without worry of its own. Health officials in Singapore are worried that they will soon face common issues that are observed in other countries such as the rise of diabetes, unsustainable fee-for-service payment models, and possibility that hospitals are learning how to game the system to make more money. To sum up, I will probably quote a commentary published by the New York Times in 2017. It says, what will continue to separate Singapore from other countries is that it seems to be more geared towards raising up all its citizens than on achieving excellence on a few high-profile areas. Singapore's system really is quite remarkable. It also turns out that it is most likely not reproducible. I hope you find the sharing today useful and I'll see you again in the next video.